Well, good evening and welcome to our Bible study tonight, Wednesday, July the 28th, 2021. So glad that you're joining me. I hope you have your Bible handy or your uh, uh, electronic device, whatever you're going to be using uh, to study the Word with me. And uh, have it open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to be in verse 19 through 22 tonight. Uh, the title of this is The Basic Christian Conduct 102. Last week, uh, we began with these final instructions that Paul was giving to the Thessalonians here uh, near the end of chapter 5, and I uh, called it uh, Basic Christian Conduct 101. And so we finished that class last week, and this is the second part of that class, so that's why I called it 102. So we'll see what happens. But we looked at verses 12 through 18 as he began just some basic uh, instructions for the Thessalonians. And I uh, wanted to uh, look at uh, verses 19 through 22 um, and uh, have that time tonight to, to look at them. So um, these are the final ones he has. This will end his instructions to us here in, in chapter 5. So uh, I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard. Uh, and uh, so you can follow along in whatever uh, translation you are using. That'll work just fine. So, Verse 19, Paul writes, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our study. Father, thank you so much for our time together. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word together. We thank you for your word and, and, and giving it to us and that we can have it and to read it, to study it, to meditate upon it, to learn it, memorize it. God, we know that that's all because of, of you and your spirit speaking uh, it through uh, the men of old that wrote it down. We just thank you, God, for doing that and giving us your word so that we can know you and know how to live our lives in better ways to serve you. We pray now that as we study together that your spirit will just illumine your word and uh, so that we can know what it means, how it applies to our lives. Pray that you'll search us afresh and anew. If there's any unclean way in us, Lord, reveal it to us so that we may confess it, ask for your forgiveness, and be cleansed from all unrighteousness through the blood of Jesus. We thank you for doing that, God. And I pray, Lord, as well, that you'll just help me to die to myself and allow your spirit to speak through me uh, and in, in and through this time as we study together so that your will will be accomplished and uh, all of us will be in tune with your spirit speaking and we can uh, gain the most uh, from this study that we can. Uh, bless it and use it for your glory, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this is a passage of scripture that you may have read through or, or read over, and sometimes it can be read through fast. But And then sometimes these uh, passages of scripture, these short verses, uh, will just be pulled out uh, just, uh, just on their own and, and sometimes used to address different situations in our Christian walk uh, or in the church's life. But uh, there's something that comes out first, of course, is, is do not quench the spirit. Now, Quench, grieve, and resist. Uh, these three things the Bible says we are not to do to the Holy Spirit. Uh, quench is, of course, found here in verse 19. Grieve is found in Ephesians 4, verse 30. And then resist is Acts chapter 7, verse 51. But tonight, we're, just, of course, just going to deal with these uh, and what's going on. But verse 19 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Now, quench means to stifle or to suppress, hinder, or extinguish. Uh, in this case, it means basically to prevent the Spirit from exerting His effect or performing His work in the believer. Uh, clearly, the reference is not to the person of the Holy Spirit Himself, uh, for He is eternal God and, and can never be extinguished. But the reference is, uh, is his activity in our hearts. And the Greek actually reads more like quit doing this, implying that the Thessalonians had in some way already been quenching the Holy Spirit uh, 
in, in, in their lives in, in, in since they had become believers. But quenching the Spirit can, can, can be in, in two things. It can apply to the quenching the Spirit within oneself or, or, or and, and or quenching the Spirit too in someone else. Okay, so it can, it can apply to either way. Uh, but quenching the spirit, we don't want to have to do that. We don't want to do that either within ourselves or to someone else. Now, Edmund Hybert wrote, the general character of the prohibition would certainly leave room for a wider interpretation. Anything that might be permitted in their assembly or in their own hearts, with hearts which was contrary to the nature and work of the spirit, would quench his operations. The Spirit's fire is quenched whenever his presence is ignored and his promptings are suppressed and rejected, or the fervor he kindles in the heart is dampened by unspiritual attitudes, criticisms, or actions. And certainly any toleration of immorality and idleness against which they have been warned would quench the Spirit's working in their midst. They must not allow the operations of the spirit to be suppressed either through yielding to the impulses of the flesh or by imposing a mechanical order upon the services that would hamper the free movements of the spirit. Now, if we look at the previous verses that we, look, that we studied last week in, in verses 16 through 18, which say, rejoice always, pray continually, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Leads Those verses leads Paul into this statement. So if we don't rejoice, pray, and give thanks, that would be quenching the Spirit and his leading. And, and how is the Spirit allowed to move in our lives if we're grumbling and complaining? Have you ever thought about that? If we're grumbling and complaining, we are not uh, being grateful um, <clears throat> to God uh, in everything as he has told us. And so we, that would be, we would be out of line in that. So it's not, uh, th that would be definitely be quenching the spirit. So how then do we quench the spirit when we ignore him, whether willfully or unconsciously? Uh, when we do not listen to what the spirit is telling us by not spending time in God's word or by not putting ourselves under the word's authority. David Jeremiah kind of agrees with this, asking, do you know what it means to quench the Holy Spirit? What do you do when you quench your thirst? You drink some water and the thirst is put away. When you quench a fire, you put it out. You smother it. How do you quench the Spirit of God? You quench the Holy Spirit by not doing something he tells you to do. When you walk in the Spirit and are filled with the Spirit, you don't want to quench him. And when he tells you to do something, you do it. Now, remember, Paul is trying to give basis, basic instructions to these new believers here in Thessalonica. And he wants them to understand there is freedom in the spirit, but they and we must allow him to move, okay? Thus, we have to submit to him and his teaching and his leading okay so as we mentioned before this can apply to the spirit working within us we don't want to quench or hinder his moving in our lives in any way sometimes that means that we <coughs> pardon me we have to step out in faith and do something that we may not be comfortable in doing yet if he tells us that we need to do it and we don't then we are quenching the spirit and in the other way, the Spirit may be working within someone else, okay? We don't want to quench or hinder his moving in that person's life in any way either. So we want to encourage his moving and working through them, not put them down or question them too much or hold them back from something that God is leading them to do. <coughs> Pardon me. Get a quick drink. Thank you. In verse 20, as we come on uh, following uh, that, he says, do not despise prophetic utterances. Okay, just like verse 19, the Greek reads, 
stop doing this as if the Thessalonians had been doing this already. And Paul is saying, you've got to quit doing this. Do not. So he starts off with 19 and 20 of do not. Do not do this. Do not do that. Now, the word despise, the Greek word used is a strong verb, which means to despise someone or something on basis that it is worthless or of no value. And the prophetic utterances, uh, that that is, it, it is the declaration of that which cannot be known by natural means. It is the foretelling of the will of God, whether with reference to the past, the present, or the future. So these prophetic utterances were meant to build up, encourage, and comfort the believers. Just like not quenching the spirit, we don't need to disregard the prophetic utterances because the spirit is moving through these that are sharing that. Now, we have to remember, too, prophecy is not just foretelling, but forthtelling. Basically, then, Paul is saying, don't look down upon someone speaking God's word. You need to listen and take note of someone who is preaching God's word. And another person writes, the gift of prophecy today is most clearly illustrated by the gift of preaching of proclaiming the word of God. That's the fourth telling, telling what God has commanded or what he has instructed, what he has said. So the messages from the word of God are actually divine revelations given by God to men of God for them to share with the people of God. Paul is wanting the Thessalonian believers to understand this uh, this is how God is going to communicate to you. He's going to bring people who will give you that teaching, that preaching, that those prophetic utterances. Now, remember at this time, <clears throat> they didn't have the full New Testament. Okay, They only had letters from the apostles. Now, you know, a lot of those eventually became uh, the New Testament, but they didn't have them in their hands. Okay, Something that they they didn't have necessarily a lot of copies of that they could reference all the time. So they needed to listen to the prophetic utterances, the sermons of the day that God, through his Holy Spirit, had inspired uh, the men of the church at that time or the leaders of the church or even the pastors of those church uh, to share, churches to share during that time in the early part of the Christian church. Now, one thing may come to your mind, just like his mind, okay, these are prophetic utterances. How did they know that they were right? Verse 21, but examine everything carefully. You've got to test everything, okay? We're no longer now in the do nots that we were in verses 19 and 20. Now Paul says, basically do this, okay? So he started this. He says, examine. That's to thoroughly test, even by fire, okay? So really put it under uh, the microscope. Examine it. Examine it. Make sure everything that is said lines up. They had to be discerning. And we also, Paul, sharing this with Thessalonians, he's also sharing this with us. We have to be discerning, discerning the Spirit. John MacArthur wrote on Paul's command for discernment, and I liked it. I wanted to go ahead and share this with you. It says, it is significant that Paul sets discernment in a context of very basic commands. It is as crucial to the effective Christian life as prayer and contentment. That may surprise some Christians who see discernment as uniquely a pastoral responsibility. It is certainly true that pastors and elders have an even greater duty to be discerning than the average layperson. Most of the calls to discernment in the New Testament are issued to church leaders. Every elder is required to be skilled in teaching truth and able to refute unsound doctrine. My passion is to know the truth and proclaim it with authority. That should be the passion of every elder because everything we teach affects the hearts and lives of those who hear us. 
it is an awesome responsibility. Any church leader who does not feel the burden of this duty ought to step down from leadership. But discernment is not only the duty of pastors and elders. The same careful discernment Paul demanded of pastors and elders is also the duty of every Christian. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 is written to the entire church. So, it is easier for us, I think, to examine what is preached or taught today because we have the entire canon uh, of Scripture, the Old Testament and New Testament. However, just like us, the Thessalonians had the Holy Spirit that would speak to them and help them to know what was truth. So what is prophetically uttered must not only line up with Scripture, but with God's character and his nature and his commands. It must line up with who Jesus is, his character, and what he has done. John writes in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Now this is, this is the New Living uh, translation that I'm reading from on this one. But listen to what John says concerning these things. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Now, Hybert adds again, I'm referencing him, the Thessalonians are not told how this testing is to be affected, but clearly it must proceed upon a spiritual standard. The Bereans tested the apostolic teaching on the base of its, of its agreement with the scriptures. We find that in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. And those scriptures that they're referring to, of course, were, were Old Testament Christ, uh, scriptures. The scriptures are our sole and sufficient criterion for the testing of all teachings that claim to have divine origin and authority. It is the function of the Holy Spirit to quicken the spiritual perception of the believer so that he is enabled to de detect spiritual error in the light of the word of God. Did you catch that? It is the Holy Spirit's responsibility to place that quickening in our spirit when we hear something that doesn't sound quite right. <clears throat> Pardon me. And we know that from John chapter 14, verse 26, John chapter 16, verse 13, and 1 John chapter 2, verses 20 through 27. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. <clears throat> but notice this. The last statement that Hiver makes here. The acu acuteness... Let me start again. The acuteness of the believer's spiritual perception is dependent upon the spirituality of his daily walk. Now, that last statement is big. How are we supposed to be hearing and listening to what the Spirit is saying if we are not walking with him daily? If we are not walking in him? and walking in the word and listening. See, we have that responsibility to make sure that we are following God's commands. We are living according to his, <coughs> excuse me, his teachings 
of how we are to be listening to the Holy Spirit speak. And then not only listening, but then doing what he says. Okay? But we have to be spending time with him each day for us to be able to hear him the best. Otherwise, our hearing is impaired. Then we come to the rest of that verse in verse 21. Let me take a quick drink again. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Now in this case, when a prophetic utterance that after examination is verified as solid teaching, pure and good, hold fast to it. Embrace it wholeheartedly. Take possession of it and keep doing it the rest of your life. When we hear the word, we need to hold fast to it, okay? We need to embrace it wholeheartedly. We need to take possession of it and make it our own. And we need to continue to follow it and do it the rest of our lives. We should never hear, hear it and say, well, that's a good word, and then not let it change our lives. <coughs> Please forgive me. When we say that, when we say that's a good word and then, and then we don't follow it, that's not embracing it. That's not making it our own. That's not holding fast to it. That's just hearing what we need to listen to and hear, but then we're not letting it apply to our lives. That's not doing us any good. It gives us head knowledge, but it doesn't do us any good. Paul wanted the Thessalonians to hold fast to the good teaching that they received, okay? So he wanted them to remember it, take it to heart, and live it out in their Christian walk. And, of course, we need to do the same. As Paul is writing this to the Thessalonians for them to do in their Christian lives, it immediately applies to our lives as well. That is what we are to do. Verse 22, Paul concludes here with this statement, abstain from every form of evil, okay? Abstain it means to keep oneself from, okay? Abstain from evil. And evil, of course, is the opposite of good. John MacArthur writes, The emphasis is on the believer's complete avoidance of any evil teaching or behavior. Nowhere does Scripture permit believers to expose themselves to the influences of what is false or evil. Instead, they are to abstain from such things and even flee them. So Paul is saying in context here that after the testing is made, any and every aspect of evil must be rejected. Anything that doesn't line up with Scripture is false teaching and is wrong and therefore is evil. It needs to be avoided. You need to flee from it. From ev Notice that every form of evil, lies, Distortion, distortion of the truth, moral perversions, etc., etc. Abstain from all of it. Okay. Now, this verse is sometimes used to apply to all sorts of things that would be maybe wrong for a Christian to do, or that would hurt a Christian's witness. <clears throat> Going to certain places, uh, listening to certain styles of music, uh, hanging around certain people. Okay. You can go on and on about that, and, and, and sometimes people will throw out, well, you know, Scripture says to abstain from every form of evil. Well, we have to understand, we've got to be mindful of that, okay? But we can't be too judgmental and legalistic because there's a lot of people that will see something there, think it's bad when it's really not, and it's not bad for that believer. So we have to be careful with those things. We also must remember that in context, in what Paul is trying to teach here, this passage, uh, Paul is wanting the Thessalonians to not listen to anything taught that is evil and did not pass the examination that he said any of these prophetic utterances must go through. Uh, what is being shared, preached, and taught is the issue, okay? That's that's what he's referring to here in the context of this passage. So these final instructions, if you think about it, all these four verses, 
They all deal with listening and following the Spirit and His speaking, His leading, His teaching. And all of us must do that as Christians. We must be listening to the Spirit and having the Spirit help us to discern, to understand what is truth here. What I am hearing is, does this line up with God's word? Is this okay to say, yes, I need to apply this to my life? So we ha must be listening to the Spirit. So Paul has finished uh, his quick wrap-up of basic Christian conduct instructions. Okay, So Lord willing, we will finish the chapter in book next week as we look at Paul's benediction and the final sayings to the Thessalonians here in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for our time together. Again, I pray that you've been able to accomplish in and through me, in and through this study, what you desired in all of our hearts. I thank you for those who are listening. Uh, we'll be watching this later. And God, I just pray that... Uh, as you promised, that your spirit will, uh, your, your word will not return void. We know it will not, and so I thank you for that. But I pray that you're able to use this study uh, in everyone's lives. That hears this as well as mine, Lord, uh, that our lives will be changed and, and for the better uh, and made stronger uh, because we've had this time studying together. And just use it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. For speaking to us, revealing to us what is right, what is wrong, what we need to grasp, and what we need to throw away. And Lord, we, we pray that you'll help us to not quench your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed our study together. Again, next week we'll try to finish uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, beginning with verse 23. And uh, we'll go through that and then lord willing uh, well not not sure where the lord will lead us next maybe we'll go to the second thessalonians i'm not sure yet we'll just see what happens on that but until uh we see each other again i hope you'll stay safe stay healthy and i hope you'll be able to join us on sunday as we come together to worship the lord again in his house and as we begin our month of missions our missions month uh in august Looking forward to that and all God's going to do in and through that time. Till then, God bless you.